please welcome Colleen Stanley. <laughs> And I don't have a superhero outfit, but I'm going to work on it. <laughs> so I'm going to take you back to 1992. And I am sitting in my brand new office. It's got a door. It's got windows. And I am looking at my new business cards that read regional sales manager. And I am so depressed. <laughs> because I have no clue as to what a regional sales manager does. Because I'm working for a fast growth company that's on this trajectory, and that means they give people like me an opportunity. And people like me are people with no experience in sales management. <laughs> now, the other thing that's happening at this company is because of the fast growth, they also don't have the formal mentoring, training, and onboarding programs, other than the go get them, good luck program. Could I see some graduates of the Go Get Em Good Luck program? Yes. So I am failing miserably at the Go Get Em Good Luck, and I'm sitting in my office, and fear of failure is setting in. And then the self-talk starts. Why did you apply for this job? Who are you to think you could lead or direct a team? You were doing just fine as a salesperson. But the biggest fear was this, that my bosses would find out that they had hired someone that was incompetent and ineffective. <laughs> and it did not take long. <laughs> Two months after my position, my boss, one of them, comes into my office and sits down. Klein. Now let me explain a little bit about Klein. Klein is a southern gentleman. He is the general manager of the company. He is also one of the original investors in the company. So let's just say he's got some skin in the game as far as this organization being highly successful. And the conversation begins. Colleen, I have been watching you. <laughs> and you are putting up a very good front. However, I know you're struggling. So I just want you to know, my office is right down the hall. And if you ever need anyone to talk to, I would welcome that visit. And he got up. <coughs> Colleen, one more thing. You're going to be just fine. Folks, that's emotional intelligence. Because that day, I was given the very precious gift of empathy. And empathy is that ability to know what somebody else is thinking or feeling. Empathy is the ability to step into someone else's shoes. Now, emotional intelligence is also knowing how to show up. And Klein knew that day that a struggling young sales manager did not need somebody barging into her office talking about the business acumen. What's the forecast? Where are we against plan? And have we filled that territory in Ohio? Instead, he applied an EQ skill, empathy, and the conversation changed. And the conversation that changed that day was the conversation I was having with myself. Because I thought, well, if Klein thinks I can do it, maybe I can. Emotional intelligence changes conversations. So let's start and learn how soft skills can actually produce hard sales results. And I would start. There's the uh, clicker. I was like, I'm going to start, but I have no clicker. All right. So let's talk about the official definition. Now, this definition comes from Daniel Goldman. He's a social psychologist, is credited with bringing it out of the academic world into the commercial business world. Now, I like this definition, but I do think it's a little textbooky. But you know, it's got that knowing your own feelings and also knowing those of others managing relationships. Let's boil it down to the simple here. Emotional intelligence is really knowing what you're feeling, why you're feeling the emotion, and most importantly, what I think like us to think about today, how it affects how you show up. Because emotionally intelligent people choose their reaction or response, even in stressful situations. Now, every day, we are going to be faced with what we call triggers. Triggers are people, places, and situations that can show up that possibly can produce a non-productive response. Let's talk about people. 
does anyone have any relatives? <laughs> Is anyone raising teenagers? That would be called a trigger. And sometimes you choose appropriately, and sometimes you don't. With increased emotion management, you can make your choices. Places. I'm guessing a few of you went through a facility called an airport to get here. Now, is anyone besides me triggered at the airport? Because I am always amazed that they are so good at hiring people that don't like people that work in the people industry. Is anybody else fascinated by that? So sometimes, even though I wrote a book on it, I don't show up very well at the airport. <laughs> and then let's talk about situations. Let's talk about a selling situation. So I'm going to pick on these three, particularly you, all right? Because I haven't had a chance to meet you in person, but I'm delighted. So here's the hypothetical selling situation. Perhaps you've been in this situation. You're meeting with three potential buyers for the first time. Two, love you. One, not so much. Anybody been in that hypothetical selling situation? Yes. Now, how do you know that buyer does not love you? Body language, short defensive answers, or no answers, or today they whip out the new weapon of choice, the smartphone. And they actually start answering emails and texting, or even maybe make a phone call. Yes. Now. If a salesperson does not have high emotional intelligence, high self-awareness, it is fairly easy to go into what we call a fight or flight response. Now, a fight response is just what it sounds like. I might get equally defensive with that prospect. And if you're actually using your college degree, you might go into a product dump. And all of a sudden, I'm going to make sure that Nicholas <laughs> recognizes at the end of this meeting just how smart I am and how stupid he is. And I start doing a product dump. Even though we have thousands of sales books written out that say ask more questions, be consultative, at that point, emotions start running the meeting rather than effective selling and communication skills. Or we can go into a flight response. Now, you may want to take a note on this. I'm going to throw out a very sophisticated term. We can often go into okie dokie. I'm out of here because I don't get paid enough to do this, and I leave the meeting, I shut down, and I say, and I'll send you some information later. Now, here's what also happens when we default to a fight or flight response. It's called the knowing and doing gap. Because let me see a show of hands. How many of us are still facing the same issues in sales that we faced 20 years ago? OK, this is going to be some reality testing. How many of you run into price shopping and your team or yourself, you're not charging what you're worth? Could I see a show of hands? OK, how many of you still are having trouble accessing the elusive decision maker, even though you go through courses at economic buyer, user buyer, technical buyer, all those cool courses? Anybody having that? And how many of you sometimes are looking at that pipeline? It is bursting full of unqualified prospects. <laughs> Maybe, just maybe, it is time to start looking at the soft skills that might be affecting the execution of hard selling skills. So let me give you a couple of examples, especially out of a flight response. So Nicholas finally looks up from his smartphone. He says, uh, is this the best that you can do? Now, I am so grateful he has finally acknowledged my presence. I said, no, well, we could probably do about 10 or 20% less. Does that work? Now, what's just happened there? Because I just got out of a salesman a meeting led by my sales manager that said, we sell on value, not price, right? Yes! And the first time I have a hostile prospect challenge me, I drop. Or you really did sit in the wrong seat today. You do know that. Or Nicholas speaks up and said, this sounds pretty interesting. Could you put something together? And again, I am so grateful that he has acknowledged my presence. I said, be happy to put something together. Now, I'm leaving the meeting, and I'm going, what am I going to put together? Do they even have a problem I can solve? Um, do they have a budget? Can this guy make a decision? And at that point, what has happened, because we are defaulting to a fight or flight response, we go along to get along. Has anyone ever experienced this? So our goal today is to learn a little bit about how the soft skills can help with that execution of hard sales results. So let's look at two EI competencies. There's 15 you can study, but I chose these two today. Assertiveness. All right, assertiveness is a huge EQ skill that will help you in sales. Assertiveness is that ability to state what you need nicely. Now, when people lack assertiveness, 
it shows up one of two ways. For sales managers, you have what I call victim sales cultures. Have you ever received a complaint from your team that said, you know, if we had better pricing, I could sell something. <laughs> if I had a better territory, if our website was better, if our mar right? OK, so what happens in victim mentality? These are people that really have trouble stating what they need nicely. I have sold with zero marketing material. I grew up in a startup that went public. They are now the biggest in the world in their industry. I have done selling with nothing, and I have done selling with sophistication. So that history for me eliminated a lot of victim mentality. But let me show you a couple other ways it shows up. It can show up in next steps. Now, the basic next step is clear next step. That's not the one I'm talking about. Has anyone ever run a meeting? You've run a very good meeting. You execute. It was, it was the most beautiful consultative selling solution selling call. And there is no pain. There is no problem to be solved. There is no commitment from that prospect. But the prospect wants to meet because they've got a lot of time on their hands. Now, they're never planning to invest any money. Have you ever seen yourself or a salesperson set up a second meeting when they should have spoken up and been assertive enough to say, Amy, I'd love to have a second meeting, but I got to tell you right now, I didn't hear enough reason for you guys to change, move, or improve. What am I missing? Now, that's a hard selling skill. What do you think it takes to say that talk track? Assertiveness or selling skills? Confidence and assertiveness. Because what it will do, it will help you get to the truth fast. Not everybody deserves a second meeting, right? And how many pipelines are full of these unqualified? And so we keep working on the hard selling skills, which are important. My suggestion is also work in the soft. Let's take a look at budget. Love this step. Here's what happens. Whatever your business is out there, salesperson asks, what's the budget you've set around for this product or service? And the typical predictable answer is, I have no idea. Just put something together. Can I see a show of hands? Who has heard that from their prospect? Yeah. So the non-assertive salesperson goes, okie dokie. And they go along to get along. And depending on your industry, spend thousands of hours and resources putting together a proposal only to come back in front of the prospect and hear this. This is too high. What was it that caused another practice proposal to be written? Was it hard selling skills or the lack of the ability to say, most people don't have a budget, that's not unusual. However, I find most people are comfortable investing this and this. Does that work for you? And if you really have a tough prospect that says, have you ever heard this? I'm not comfortable sharing that with you. <laughs> then I'm not comfortable writing a proposal. I haven't worked <laughs> pro bono in a lot of years. That would be called a nonprofit. Now, there's a nicer way to do that. But <laughs> on any given day, I might. But it's the assertiveness. So I find most people aren't assertive enough, assertive enough to get the budget. And then how about the decision maker? Now, we've got Stu in the room, and he does win-loss analysis. And by the way, if you just do your own informal win-loss analysis, is it pretty fair to note that you know that you must speak with this decision maker or this deal's not moving forward or getting done at all, right? So when they ask to get the meeting and they don't get that next step, doesn't the assertive salesperson have the ability to say, you know, Nicholas, I would love to move forward, but I got to tell you, in my experience, if I don't meet with Vince, one of two things will happen. I'm going to write a proposal. It's going to be wrong. And then neither one of us is going to move forward, and we both wasted a lot of time. What do you suggest we do? Get assertive to quit wasting time. And by the way, you can do that nicely. And there's a whole bunch of selling techniques that you probably wouldn't even get in that situation. But if you do, it is assertiveness as well as a hard skill so that'll move it forward. Let's take a look at another soft skill. Impulse control. This is my favorite one. Let me share the story with you behind the marshmallow. So this comes from the 1960s, Walter Michelle, the marshmallow study. Some of you might have heard this story. So back in the 60s, he is studying human performance and he decides to get a group of four-year-olds together. He takes these four-year-olds. By the way, who has a four-year-old in the room? OK, do not do this test when you go home. It doesn't work. This is what they always do after they hear the story. And so what he did, he took this group of four-year-olds, and he put each one in a separate room. And then he put a marshmallow in front of each child. 
and said, now, I'm going to give you this marshmallow. If you don't eat it, when I come back in 15 minutes, I will give you two. Now, you're four. What are you going to do? I grew up in a family of eight kids. That thing, if you didn't eat it now, would not be there in five minutes. Hence the reason I have low impulse control. Now, but here's what happened. And if you Google this, you will find some very funny YouTube videos. One little kid, we're sure he's a felon. Because he picks up his marshmallow, he looks left and right, takes a bite out of the bottom, puts it down. <laughs> the next one, we're pretty sure, is running all the cannabis clinics we've got going on in Colorado, OK? Picks up the marshmallow, smells, and is like, this is fabulous, all right, but does put it down. And the other little girl just gives up. But here's what the research showed. He followed these children for 14 years. The kids that were able to delay the impulse, delay the gratification, scored 200 points higher in SAT scores. They enjoyed more success personally and professionally. So how does impulse control play into sales success? Well, here's a few things I've seen. For those sales organizations that are not divided by inside account executive account management, perhaps the salesperson has to do the sourcing and the selling. It's not sales knowledge. The manager lays out the key performance program, do this number of calls, do this much activity. And here's what happens. The salesperson is really motivated for that first month, and they make the calls, the outreaches, the networking, the associations, asking for referrals, whatever it looks like in your business. And then after a month, there isn't any results. So then they start surfing the net, looking at their personal Facebook page or they're shuffling business cards around in the deck. Now, is that a hard selling skill that I don't know what to do? Or is it a soft skill that I'm giving into the pull of instant gratification? Because all of us know anything, whether it's business development, learning sales skills is a process, not an event. Instant gratification is the opposite of impulse control. It is the root cause for people not executing consistent business development activity. Questioning and qualifying. Really? Really? You guys, there's about eight questions we should all ask on a call, right? I mean, it's not really hard, is it? How many of you know the Pledge of Allegiance? OK, you memorized that sucker in second grade. You know the questions to ask. So why is it when the prospect raises a trigger and says, you know, we need to do this. We think this is a good idea. What happens is that impulse to serve offer a solution, takes over asking problematic diagnostic questions. Yes, there's questions to ask. I promise you, if they're not asking eight basic questions, it is not about IQ. It is totally about the EQ, impulse control. And the last one, major account selling. Sales manager is at the meeting, says, folks, we need to pursue the big dogs. We need to get a pursuit strategy. We lay out the 10 touch points. We got emails that they're great, cold calls, uh, uh, introductions, referrals. What's the real reason salespeople aren't pursuing the large accounts? Is it a knowledge sales IQ? Or is it just possibly that major account selling takes longer? Multiple decision makers. More strategizing. You must put in the work to get the reward. You have to have customized value propositions for each buyer you call on. You run multiple meetings. It's not necessarily not knowing how to navigate through a complex sale. It's just easier to grab the low hanging fruit. Now remember, I am not saying don't focus and learn hard selling skills. We teach them all day long. You've got to include the EQ. So let's take a look at three things we can do to improve. All right, number one, focus. Jill just talked about that. It is the new competitive weapon. Multitasking doesn't work, and I don't care if you're 15. It's called your brain. Second thing is, diagnose. Which end of the spectrum do you work on, soft or hard skills? And the next one, model the behavior you want to see. Your actions will always speak louder than words. So I hope today you know that Soft skills do produce hard sales results. Thanks. <laughs>